This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And this week we are joined by Kristen Marting of <coughs> Here and the Prototype Festival. Prototype is a, a really cool music and theater amalgamation that started last year and they're get, gearing up for their 2014 uh, e- exhibition. Kristen, thank you for being with us this morning. My pleasure. Good morning. So for, for those who missed it last time, can you maybe just explain a little bit about what Prototype is? Sure. Uh, Prototype is a new opera theater, music theater festival that's been started by Beth Morrison Projects and HERE. Um, I'm the artistic director of HERE, and I'm joined with Kim Whitener, who's our producing director. Beth is the creative producer, creative artistic producer of Beth Morrison Projects, and the three of us together are the directors of Prototype. So Prototype, we wanted to make a place in January when so many people come to New York to see work. Uh, we felt like there was a lot of work being seen in other areas, but in opera theater and music theater, we were really underrepresented. And we wanted to create a gathering place where um, audiences and presenters and producers could all come see this work in a concentrated amount of time and um, see some really fantastic work and hopefully to encourage touring of this new contemporary work that's happening that isn't making it to a lot of other places. So that seems really ambitious. And we've talked about this before uh, on, on the show is kind of the growth of theatrical presentations and and things that some people call operas and some people like just are a little weirded out by the expression opera because of all of the baggage that it carries back to like the 14th century Mm -hmm. so what what draws you to this kind of presentation and and you know why why do you think this is a, a relevant genre or medium in 2013 or well, I think that, it, yeah, I mean, I think that for both Beth Morrison Projects and for here, um, we work with a variety of artists and we've had these artists that are making this work and they're choosing to call it contemporary opera or indie opera or opera theater. They're, they're, they're self-labeling that that's the work that they're making. And so we're taking up that mantle with them. Um, but I think this isn't your grandma's opera. I mean, this is very Absolutely. contemporary work. <laughs> it's got... It's classically trained musicians, but they're doing completely unusual arrangements, completely unusual approaches. Um, They're using the voice in different ways. Um, You know, it's a range from, uh, like last season, we had Sumeda's song uh, by Mohamed Farouz, where he was really using the voice um, with Eastern influences, uh, you know, Western trained opera voices, but using Eastern influences, or we had David T. Little soldier songs where it was really rock inspired and both the way that, that his ensemble plays and the, the structure of the music is really rock inspired, but it has an operatic sound. So um, the artists are choosing to label themselves that way and we're psyched to go that road with them, but we are calling it opera theater and music theater to distinguish a bit from a traditional opera understanding. That's uh, an interesting thing is the the growth of excitement around opera, I think. And this is something that you mentioned in, in uh, I think, on the Prototype website, but it's something that we've observed as well, is that when you think of opera, it's such a, 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 an amazingly large undertaking, even on a relatively small scale like most of the productions at prototype are are small in number like the the forces are small in number um and slightly obviously smaller venues than say the met but um it's something that we usually think of as relegated or reserved for composers that are pretty far along in their careers and that have had a lot of success because it's such uh, a financial investment to put on one of these productions. Uh-huh. But we're seeing more and more young composers that want to talk about, th- that want to do this, oh. that want to work in this space. Why do you th- think that is? I mean, I think that it's similar to, uh, I think that they want to tell the story, they want to tell the way they want to tell it, and they don't want to wait to do it when it's appropriate in their career, they're going to make this opportunity for themselves. They want to tackle complex psychological subject matter and complex musical subject approach. They they want to um, really use all of their skills to create their work today. So I I just think, I, I, I just think that 
the notion that they needed to wait till they had more resources is just not acceptable to contemporary composers working today. So they're just going to do it the way they want to do it now um, mm -hmm. and figure out how to make that be musically exciting and theatrically engaging. Well, and you have to wonder also a little bit pessimistically, if you if one were to wait, would those resources even be available at that time? Because, right. you, you know, we've we've seen just in the last month or so the the closing of, of city opera and how it's going to affect the opera scene in in new york city is do you see that as something that's going to affect what you do with prototype um no i mean it's a really a really tragic thing i think for the city to lose that opera company um i think that there's there's a plethora of smaller companies working across the city doing exciting work and um prototype is one of the many groups um there's a New York Opera Alliance that is trying to acknowledge all this opera work that's happening here in the city. And um, I can't remember how many members there are, but there were many more than I expected. I think it was like 36 or 40 members. I'm sorry, wow. I don't have that number off the top of my head. But there's that many companies that are making work here in the city. So I think there's still a vibrancy. Um, I think it's just a question of scale. Um, and those independent companies, some of them are doing very small scale productions and other are doing like Gotham is doing much larger scale. Um, so you, you have a range even within the community of work. And we just need a, to have another larger company be able to work as well. Um, and I'm, I think there's support here in the city for it um, and that that will grow up out of either the existing companies or out of new collaborations that happen among people. Yeah, that'll be yeah. really exciting. Sam, what were you going to say? Well, she keeps, I keep thinking, oh, I'm going to ask this question, and then she gets around to addressing it before I ask. <laughs> um, the thing I was thinking about when I was reading about Prototype is the issue of scale. Um, mm. Certainly, big opera companies are around, and they do big productions, but it's nice to be a composer and think, oh, I can do an opera, and I don't have to worry about, you know, renting elephants or having fireworks, or it, it seems to me related to the DIY culture that it's becoming more pervasive in younger artists to think that you're going to be able to do a show and it self describes on the pro prototype website, a chamber setting. So do a meaningful operatic presentation and, and the scale is such that it's manageable from a personnel standpoint and from a financial standpoint. And the idea of being able to tour with it is, is much less complicated because the, the scale is more manageable. Um, to me, that is an amazing thing. Um, the other thing is, and I'm, I'm the last person who would claim to be really familiar with everything going on in the opera scene, um, but when I think about opera, of course, I think about the operas I've seen, which are very traditional, and they deal with traditional topics and, you know, ranging from mythology to the same stories you've seen over and over again, but looking at the programs you guys have on the 2014 uh, series coming up in January, just the first two, Thumbprint, um, is about a woman in Pakistan who was gang raped for uh, an honor crime against her brother, and she doesn't back down and brings her attackers to justice. And that's a very present topic. We hear about this kind of thing in the news all the time. And then Have a Good Day, the next one, a Lithuanian composer who it's sort of about the uh, dehumanization of workers through the capitalist system. These are very present topics that they're not relying on mythology to make points about humanity. They're relying on what's going on with humanity right now to make points about humanity. And to me, that has an extreme value and in a lot of ways more present and more valuable than, I don't know, you know. And it's the thing that requires the nimbleness of that scale that you were talking about, too, yes. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean... We Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, what do you do you when you're picking your uh, the shows that you're going to include in the program? Are you thinking along those lines at all? Uh, I mean, we're definitely thinking about um, contemporary work, and we're thinking about expressing a spectrum. Um, you know, in this season, we have also we have Sky Pony, which is uh, cabaret style. Uh, uh, it's Kyle Jero and Lauren Morsham, and. It, it and their ensemble and it's a cabaret style really fun rock inspired music theater but she's a classically trained singer um and it's a really playful fun evening and uh and then we have elizabetta that we programmed at joe's pub um and she's just for one night she's a los angeles based um really beautiful um interesting and engaging singer performer um writer 
performer. Uh, and then, yes, we have thumbprint. We have have a good day. So we think about how we can engage a spectrum of audiences to cross in this festival because there are people who would go to Sky Pony who might not go to Thumbprint, but because those things are in the same festival, they might decide to go to Thumbprint. Or, you know, they might have never been to a Lithuanian opera before, but because they're coming to see Paul's case, um, Gregory Spears' piece, you know, they get interested in Gregory's case, in, in Paul's case, and then they decide to check out something else that's a completely different genre. So we try both in terms of subject matter and in terms of the uh, approach that is taken to the music to have a really broad spectrum that engages right. that range of audiences. And I think that's a really interesting thing that I was also going to ask about is the, the, the spectrum of kind of genres that you're bringing together. And there is a lot of theatricality in a lot of more kind of popular styles of music. And, and there, there is, a, I, I just, we just talked about a, a story that somebody had written on New Music Box, I don't, and I'm going to leave off this person's name, and I'm sorry for that, about the production of Kanye's Yeezus tour. and oh, how Isaac Shankler. Oh, was that Shankler? Yeah. Okay, so Isaac Shankler. Thank you, Isaac. Um, <laughs> for, for talking about the kind of operatic nature of this pop performance and it was it was really interesting and i i love seeing the ways in which these two spaces are growing into one another and in prototype is i think a really great example of that is when you when you talk about a band that's got a relatively theatrical show or uh that has a lot of multimedia elements or something just like uh, a kanye show would have it's, mm -hmm. it's really compelling um is that something that that you want to continue to explore that that intermediate space with, with Ab prototype? absolutely i mean we really uh, want to push the limits of how people think about opera theater or music theater so like in the first uh in the first season we had this piece bluebeard where there were actually no live performers um and so that really begged the question of what is opera what is performance um it was this design collaborative um <clears throat> 33 and a third and they created this design universe that the piece existed in. And there was this big white cube that moved around that they projected onto. And those three designers were present, but they had created a score with an ensemble of musicians, a singer and a conductor that was recorded, that was presented with it. So that really, you know, so we're just really interested in having people ask that question when they come to our festival that, oh, I thought opera wasn't that, or, oh, I thought this wasn't that, you know, like to have people really think about it. And we hope that Every year we can be provocative enough in the range of programming that people think about that and engage in that conversation amongst themselves, you know? Well, something we discuss on the show seemingly every week is uh, the issue everyone involved in new music is faced with is how to get new audiences engaged and how to make it seem like something that people want to try out. And to me, in making it a theatrical experience is the easiest way to get people mm -hmm. to embrace new sounds. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done experience, experiments with my class where I prove to them that they're more amenable to hearing what they might consider ugly noises when it's accompanied with some sort of visual thing that they're experiencing right. simultaneously. Um, I'm very interested in, uh, as Dave was talking about, the, the sort of uh, the intermediate space um, I was wondering if you could talk about the, uh, I mean, in the, on the in the vein of trying to make your thing cool and get people interested, you have the lounge, and is this is like an after hours experience where people are going to be performing, but it's still going to have a sort of a theatrical flair. Yeah, I, this is a new thing this year. Um, at this time, besides Prototype, there's the Under the Radar Festival, the Coil Festival, and the uh, American Realness Festival. There's also a bunch of other things, but the four of our festivals got together to decide to do a late-night lounge. We all have different programming, but we've co-curated, so we feel like the, the lounge is going to have a mixture of what you might see in any of the festivals. Not the same artists, but the same kind of aesthetic um, mm -hmm as what you might, not necessarily the same artists. In some cases, we're programming some of the same artists from the festivals into the lounge. But um, it's late night. It starts at 9.30 and goes till quite late. It's a very informal context. Everybody is going to be drinking, and there's going to be a DJ after, so there's kind of dancing, and then these performances will happen in short sets, like 30, 45 minutes. These will be much more traditional, um, you know, like band sets or uh, theatrical, like, quicks, stand-up, 
you know, and do simple add a microphone kind of stuff. But, right. um, but it, it's just another way to engage and it's free. So if people come to the festivals, they can come check out the late night lounge uh, for free. And it's at the public theater at uh, upstairs. Yeah. And I'm hopefully that's where some new collaborative projects will emerge. Exactly. <laughs> that's yeah, usually how it so. happens. That's why um, we're interested in jointly curating it was to create that kind of um, cross conversation among the artists and the different festivals. Um, so I'm wondering how you pick the pieces that end up being programmed. Do you approach the artists or do people apply? How does that process work? No, um, Kim and Beth and I go out to see work um, all year. And I mean, since we started the festival, uh, we started thinking about this festival in 2011. And so we started looking for work and looking for funding back in 2011 and then launched it in January of 2013. So we all three of us go to attend festivals. Um, we've served on panels. Beth particularly has served on some new music panels in Europe, selection panels that has opened us up to artists that we might not have become aware of because they weren't even on festival circuits yet. Um, so it's just been a whole range of experiences. And then artists that we get introduced to through other people that we meet. Um, and just we have a lot of discussion and we have a long spreadsheet of artists that we're considering and thinking about and we're seeing their work and having an ongoing relationship. Um, every year we want to have a world premiere that we co-produce together, BMP and mm -hmm. here. Um, every year we want to bring at least one international piece. Every year we want to have at least one national uh, presentation, possibly two. Um, and then we usually will bring in, um, a, we have a work in progress, uh, like a concert uh, performance. This year it's Angel's Bone by Du Young, who's a really interesting um, experimental composer. Um, and she's working with Royce Favarek um, as the librettist. Uh, and then uh, try to have something that is uh, more of a fun cabaret experience. First year it was Timur in the Dime Museum and this year it's Sky Pony. Um, and then this year we also added Elisabetta in that category. So we have um, sort of slots that we're trying to fill in terms of the type of work. Um, but uh, each year it's really trying to see how the different pieces fit together. There were a couple of pieces that we were interested in, but we didn't think with a couple of the things we've already chosen that it was the best fit for this year. So we were thinking of them for next year instead. So, Right. Okay. That's, have you considered... Uh, embracing the idea of a commissioning project in relationship to the festival at all? Well, the, the world premiere, we are commissioning, but, okay. but um, yes. And so then the, the next piece that we have in development is the Scarlet Ibis, which has been developed uh, through the here artist residency program. We have a lot at here. We have a long-term residency program for 15 to 18 artists from all disciplines, theater, music, dance, puppetry, and media arts. And those artists, we foster the long-term development of a single project with them. And, it's a two to three year process generally in most artists' cases. And so Scarlet Ibis um, has been in development uh, since before Prototype started. But that is that is our world premiere for 2014. So we've been growing that piece. And Beth's been involved with Thumbprint from the inception. She originally um, invited the composer Kamala Shankaram and the librettist uh, Susan Yankowitz to... Uh, work together. She had seen Seven, which was a play that Susan was part of. It was seven different incredible women from across the country who were dealing with overcoming human rights obstacles. And she really got attached to the story of Mukhtar Mai. And so she approached Kamala and said, Kamala, would you write a short piece for uh, Beth does this 21st century leader, Robin, which just happens last night. In fact, uh, just closed last night at BAM. Um, but it happens at different locations. I think that year it was at the kitchen. So she uh, commissioned uh, Kamala to do a short piece um, from Susan's work on Seven. Out of that came the idea to do it as a full-length opera. And so then we all, we got here got involved in it in the last year. Um, Beth and Kamala and Susan had continued to develop it some, and then here got involved with it in the last year, and now we've grown it into our world premiere for this year. So we're really interested in fostering a long-term relationship with composers, but then we also want to bring composers that people haven't heard of in New York um, who we think are working in a similar genre and, and with a similar... Um, sense of inventiveness that is happening here in the New York scene. Okay. Well, you mentioned uh, the group that you're a uh, big part of, and I, I think we should just go ahead and talk about that. And people might be confused because you keep saying here. Yes. And, and <laughs> that is actually the name of an organization. It's all capital letters. So figure out how to intone it in a way that people hear it in capital letters. So why don't you tell us about, because this here has been around for quite a while. Is that correct? 
It is. Yeah. Um, we are just finished celebrating our 20th anniversary. Um, I'm one of the co-founders, so I've been there since its inception. Um, and we have, we're a venue. We have two theaters and a gallery cafe. Um, and we um, program work year round. And as I mentioned, we are an incubator and we develop work through the residency program. But then we also are a presenter of work. Um, and we bring international artists, uh, usually several projects in a season. Um, sometimes it might just be two projects. Right now, we're just generally doing one or two projects outside of Prototype because Prototype is such a big festival for us. Um, and then uh, we also make a space for local artists to self-produce um, at a subsidized rate. So we kind of have these three different ways that we work with artists. Okay, very nice. And you have residency programs for artists. Yes. Um, do you, uh, I'm the education guy on the show, so I always ask about education. Do you uh, do any kind of educational programs through here? Well, I, I have two different kind of answers to that. I mean, one of the things is that our residency program is sort of, I think about it as adult education, peer-to-peer -peer education, because mm -hmm. we started it because we were seeing mid-career artists burning out and leaving the field as their work was getting more expensive and complex and harder for them to manage they needed additional skills. And so we founded the program so the artists could be a community amongst themselves and they could help each other see the answers to the problems that they were facing. And then we also, with them, we have sessions that we call breakout sessions every month and they're on whatever topics the artists want. So like we've had them on, we've had entertainment lawyers in to talk to them about collaboration agreements and intellectual property, or we've had accountants in to talk to them about how to file their taxes, or a press agent in to talk to them about how to position themselves um, to the press. So we do different things with them that are increasing their um, knowledge and skill base so that they can stay in the field for the long term. Um, okay. Then, But yes, in a more traditional sense, we have what we call Start Here, which is a kids program. It's for uh, what we say is uh, generally um, adventurous kids and their families. Um, and we think of them as eight and up. Um, generally, some of our stuff we curate is for 12 and up. So, you know, in the spring, we have something that we're bringing called The House. Um, and we have, a, a, we do a lot of puppetry work. Our puppetry work is generally for adults, but some of it is geared for younger audiences. So we have a piece in December called The Pigeoning um, that is going to be for ages 12 and up. Um, and it's a really fun piece about this guy, Frank, who gets kind of OCD about pigeons and some pigeon apocalypse or apocalypse that might be coming that the pigeons are involved in. So. <laughs> I really loved that the idea of that first side of your your education program, the the education for the the professionals that are all, you're already working with. I think that's amazing. One topic that comes up on the show a lot is all of the things that we wished we had learned when we were in school, and that, that we had, <laughs> you know, all because you know we went to music school. I my my degrees on the wall over here, but there's there's still so much that. And I don't think it's anything that was missing from my institution in particular. It's just something that was in general not part of what people thought is important in teaching people to be composers. But right. it clearly is something that's, that's really important for composers to know in 2013. So that's, I think, a really delightful thing for, for here to be working on. And it reminds me a lot of the 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 DIY movement and hacker spaces. Like this is uh -huh. almost like the a sort of thing that a <laughs> hacker space would do. Like we all decided that we wanted to, you know, be able to weld things. And so we bought an arc welder for the hacker space and brought somebody <laughs> in to teach everybody how to use it. Or we all decided, uh, you know, we wanted to know how to uh, make our own house key copies. And so we bought a machine to do that. And we learned how to make keys for everybody to get into the building or like, that's a very, um, kind of uh, self-sustaining model. And, mm. and I, I think it's a really interesting thing for a group that also presents work to be doing to support the people that are presenting that work. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I don't really, that, I don't have a question there. I'm just uh, applauding yeah. it. I think it's a really cool project that, that you have. Thanks. Yes, and I'm envious and, and have extreme admir admiration for you. <laughs> um, so what is your, uh, obviously you're interested in opera and all kinds of theatrical arts. What's your background? How did you become interested in this? 
Uh, well, I'm trained as the theater director on that topic of, you know, you don't get the training that you then need <laughs> professionally. So <laughs> I, I really went to school for theater and then I started a theater company and uh, started to need to develop other skills. So I still work as a director and I direct um, usually um, more text-based works, but with live music. Live music has always been a part of my work from when I was when I first started directing when I was in college. I collaborated with musicians a lot, and so I always have had that thread in my work and um, a lot of choreography and a lot of video. So that's just my personal aesthetic, and uh, my work is hybrid, and I'm interested in supporting hybrid work, and opera theater is certainly a very hybrid form, so it's been a really, um, it's something that we've had growing. You know, Kamala, um, who's the composer of Thumbprint, was in our program for four years developing her first opera, which was called Miranda, which was a murder mystery opera. And, um, and, and, and I just am interested in fostering um, innovative work. Um, and that's what Kim Whitener, who's the producing director here, she, that she also has a really firm commitment to that. So together we try to just find the most adventuresome artists and bring them into our space and get excited. And that's what Beth does with BMP. So it was a natural marriage for BMP and here to come together and uh, we already had composers in common, like Kamala, um, and uh, Beth had worked with Stefan Weissman before, and we had Stefan, uh, who had just started with Harp. Um, he's doing the Scarlet Ibis. So, you know, we there was a natural affinity for what we were attracted to um, as curators. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, I've always thought, and I'm not the only one who thinks, that the, uh, sometimes the most uh, meaningful creative thoughts come from collaborative efforts. And opera is sort of by definition a collaborative effort. So we really right. appreciate anyone who inspires artists or makes a space for artists to really be fruitful in that area. Um, is there anything new coming up for uh, Prototype? Do you have big plans for the 2015 season already? Um, well, besides Scarlet Ibis, we can't announce anything yet for 2015. Ah. But we do have some exciting stuff coming. Um, and uh, and 2014 is just around the corner. I mean, it's January 8th to the 19th. You'll, there, there's seven things to see. I haven't talked about visitations, which I need to talk about. Yes. That's what we haven't mentioned at all. Um, it's a really special piece. Um, it's also very contemporary, um, you know, in terms of what you were saying, its relationship to issues of today. Um, it's Visitations has two parts to it. Um, the Otakia is a thing that's really dealing with uh, mental health issues, Um and um, it's, it, it, it's, it's complex and emotionally nuanced. And then The War Reporter um, is the real story of a Pulitzer Prize uh, journalist who was um, taking photography um, uh, in Africa. And he took a picture that really stayed with him. And he wrote a piece about it um, uh, and started Dan O'Brien, who's the librettist, did some interviews with him. And he made this piece that was about that. Um, the composer of both those things that are together. And I, I think that the, the connection between them, you see when you see the piece, um, it, it's about sort of, both of them are dealing with like hallucination um, in a really interesting way. And so, because you sort of are like, oh, well, what's the connection between these two? They're like hauntings. There are hauntings in both pieces and that's what it's kind of bringing to fore. Um, and uh, Beth premiered this work in California at Stanford and uh, we were really excited to buy it and then wanted to include it in prototype and bring it to New York. So we're excited to be bringing that to New York. Um, and it's going to be out at Roulette. Yeah, that's one other thing to mention is that the festival is not just at here. It's We have some of the projects at here. Um, Thumbprint is going to be up at Baruch Performing Arts Center. Um, we're out at Roulette at, uh, at Joe's Pub. And then um, Angel's Bone, which I mentioned is our concert reading, um, is being done in collaboration with the Trinity uh, Wall Street Choir, and it'll be down at the church. So we're excited about that. Yeah. Sorry, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Sam is writing all these things down so that he can learn more about them later. Yes. Uh, so you you have a, and I mentioned this before the show, a wonderful website, and you mentioned that you have done work in video, but uh, I, and then there's some really great video documentation of the, the live performances on your site, mm -hmm. and do you, how important do you think that is to what you guys are doing with, with Prototype and with Here, to have that, uh, that documentation of the performances available for people to see on the web? Well, I think that a lot of people want to know what their experience might be. And so this is just giving, because 
except for Thumbprint, which is a world premiere, these, you know, most of these works have existed in other places. So there is an opportunity to get a little flavor of what you might see and you will decide to take a risk and come see it. I mean, most of these composers are unknown composers. So people are not sure what their experience might be like. So we want them to feel like, oh, that looks really exciting. Or, I, you know, I'm going to take a risk and do that with a little more knowledge. Because I think today people really like to see that stuff before they go to understand a little bit of what their experience might be. Um, we do that a lot with here too. If you go around on our site, um, we have our resident artists, there are pages that each of them have and they populate the content themselves with stuff that they want to express about their work. So sometimes there's rehearsal shots or images that have inspired them or things that they write about, about a recent rehearsal, um, as well as more traditional show description and pretty pictures and all that kind of stuff. But we think that Philosophically, uh, you know, we, we're really interested in engaging people in a lot of different ways to think about work today because I think people are hungry for more information and for a deeper experience. Um, so that's what we're trying to offer. So when you talk about that deeper experience, one thing, uh, looking at your wonderful website and looking at uh, last year's Prototype Festival, you had a, a, an event on the schedule called Prototype Conversations. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that is? It sounds it sounds like literally a conversation about the work that you're putting on. It is. Yeah. I mean, we uh, we're organizing a series of them this year too, and I think that this year we're listing them on each show page, but I think I'm oh, just okay. going to I I think yeah, I think they're only listed on each show page and they're on the calendar, but you know, like for Thumbprint we actually have Mukhtar Mai, uh, the woman who is the oh, inspiration wow. for the opera, um, is going to appear over Skype. I mean, she's in Pakistan, so she, right. we, we can't afford to fly her in. But she's going to appear on it. And there are some awesome other people who will be speaking on that panel that are all um, – deeply connected to the human rights issues. So, uh, and similarly on Angel's Bone, that show deals with human trafficking and um, with Trinity Wall Street, we're organizing a panel of people who are working in that field um, from different sides of it um, to engage in a conversation about that. So we're really interested in, you experience the work, but then there's an opportunity to amplify the conversation um, by talking with the issue about the issues that the work engages. We're going to do one on global indie opera one night also, and we'll have some of the artists in the festival talking about that. Um, we're going to do one uh, around Paul's case about working at different scales in opera. So there's some stuff that we're trying to do to engage people in conversation about what's going on in the field and some stuff where we're trying to deepen the conversation about the issues. Um, so that's of interest to us. That's, that's wonderful. And what was the what was the uptake on that last year? Were there a lot of people that I, I assume since you're doing it again that it was yeah. you deemed it successful? Yeah. Um, but what is the reaction like? What kinds of people are sticking around, and what kinds of conversations are you having? Like, uh, is is this? I I worry when we present new music a lot that mm -hmm. the conversation is only with other people that are also making new music and not with normal people. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, and I'm wondering what your experience is with these conversations. Well, we found, I mean, we do these kind of conversations at here with all of our programming, but I have to say we have found that the music community is um, the audiences that come to that work are hungrier for those conversations that we have much higher attendance uh, to those than we do to a number of other things. So of, of post-performance discussions or panel discussions that we organize. So when we started a prototype, we knew that we wanted to do these. And a, a lot of people say, yes, you definitely have some you know, it, music people who are the community who are who are going to stay. But then you also have a lot of audience members who just like love this work and they want to know more about it. Um, but we'll usually have like maybe two thirds of the audience stay for these discussions. There's that much level of interest because we promote that they're that specific day. So uh, ostensibly, those audience members are coming that day because they want right. to be part of that conversation. That's you know? great. That's great. I, I love that you're you've got a, a balance between the the new opera people and the normal people. Um, but they're also the, the idea that that is part of the special thing at that performance is like, this is the performance where we're going to have a really, not only a great show, but a great conversation about the show. And that's mm -hmm. a, a really, I think, exciting, uh, proposition to include that it, not only that you're proposing it, but also that it's working is really <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we keep trying. <laughs> we also have a bar at all of our, our all of our venues. Well, that's a big draw. So we can have informal conversation as well, which I think is just as important. Sure. Yeah, that's really great. 
Uh, Sam, do you think it's time to move into our stories? Sure thing. Uh, we've got some, this is a very Sam, we've got a bunch of very Sam Mercier's kinds of stories this week. And mm. it, it involves popular music, and it involves BitTorrent, and it involves remixing. It's like, I, I almost thought you made it up when I read about it. Uh, no, no. So what's, um, what's the deal? I... Uh, Aging techno artist is how I heard him referred to in the. Oh, that's in the, sad. Uh, yeah, Moby, who is still around and has just produced his eleventh studio album, has released it simultaneously with the traditional release available in hard copy or download. He's released the entire thing via BitTorrent. Um, by, or, by a special new thing that, but not like just like throwing it up on BitTorrent. There's a new thing that BitTorrent's yes. doing called BitTorrent Bundles. Just to be clear, right? Well, it's BitTorrent Bundles, and he's not just making the 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 uh, the album itself available through BitTorrent. He's making the what people call stems. In other words, the individual tracks that make up each piece is going to be available for remix. So not just the songs themselves, but the individual tracks. So Synthesizer 1 and Synthesizer 2 and Percussion 1 and Percussion 2 or whatever is going to all be available as single, clean tracks for uh, Remix. Um, now, he's just making it available. As far as I know, um, there's no kind of contest or anything start, uh, related to that. No, but um, there are a lot of Moby fans, so there's the there's inherent lot, contest. There's a lot of Moby fans, and there's already been a, a bunch of... Uh, the bundle has been downloaded well at the time of this publication, which was, you know, like a week ago or so. It, the bundle has been downloaded 2 million times, and 50, and the album has just been released, and 50 remixes as of the publish of this article have been already uploaded to SoundCloud. So uh, to me, that's a fantastic way for an artist to release content and really engage. You know, if you want to get the new Moby album and you just want to listen to it, but also Moby has some hardcore fans who are the kind of people who are going to be into using synthesizers and audio hardware and this kind of thing. So, and there are lots um, of crazy people on the internet. Yeah, and they'll the people and crazy in a good way. Like, is you know, they're crazy, but they're my kind of crazy, crazy. Uh, that see a thing and say, "Hey, I can make a another new great thing out of that thing." And that's really exciting. Would you ever do that with your music, Sam? Uh, yes, I would. Yeah, I I do actually. Oh, you do. Um, have you re have you remixed uh, anything like this before, or have you offered anyone to remix your music before? I have stuff of my own. I sliced up my clarinet trio as an example into individual. You can't put it in stems because I didn't multi-track it when it was recorded, but. I chopped it up into the individual parts that kind of like stand alone as a thing and uploaded each individual part to uh, CC Mixter and made it available for use to anybody who wanted. And I put the, I, I put the, I donate this to the Cosmos uh, uh, copyright moniker on it. So anybody can use it for anything they want and they can either, you know, give me credit or not give me credit. I don't care. Do you know of anybody that's used it? Some people have used it uh, for a couple of things, and a lot of people have commented and said that, you know, there's one section, the part where all the clarinets are repeating E-flat with different fingerings, if you are familiar with the piece at all, Dave. Yeah. A lot of people have commented that that sounds really cool, and that's the part that people have used. I think they've used it as a background sort of. Like a drone. A drone kind of background thing. Um, it should be noted, speaking of that kind of thing, that uh, Moby also has a, a website called MobyGratis.com where he gives away music to film students and indie filmmakers and stuff like that. Um, so in addition to, you know, making this content available for remix, which the first thing I thought was, you know, if you're a filmmaker, there you go. You got a whole bunch of clean, nicely generated content you can use to make your soundtrack with. But he also has a website where he engages in that um, very actively, giving away music for, or giving away free, you know, audio content for people to use in a lot of different applications. So, That's Kristen, cool. are you going to be uh, remixing any any opera performances? Yeah, right. You're getting me thinking. <laughs> um, that's a that's a, a th thing that's been trending. Uh, we covered a story, uh, non classical, a label out of uh, the UK, um, did a project with uh, Gabriel Prokofiev, where he wrote yeah. a cello piece called Jerk Driver, 
and it was a solo cello piece, but it was released. The album was a was the original composition and a group of remixes of the piece released simultaneously with the original composition. Yeah. Well, and we talked last week about New Amsterdam in their remixes of um, uh, Carolyn Shaw's Partita. Mm-hmm. They just won the Pulitzer, and they're releasing a remix of Partita every week for the next few, next like eight weeks or something, uh, as part of their annual fundraising project. So that's a very cool thing as well that, that New Amsterdam is doing that's also remixing frumpy classical music. How does one go about remixing opera? The only remix of opera I know is John Cage, your opera. Well, <laughs> well, here we got, I got Aria, the score for Aria right here behind me. And I think you you're go. supposed to perform that with other stuff happening at the same time. The interesting thing about doing it with theater is that it's more than just the sound. Like it's really yeah. easy to take this snip of uh, audio and throw it into whatever your DAW is and, you know, tweak it and add effects and stretch it and, I don't, I don't understand. I don't know the buttons you press, but you, it's much easier to do with a piece of audio than it is with a live performance of visual and multimedia. And you know, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know how that would be done. Maybe it would be like the kind of thing we've seen done before with uh, in C when the Grand Valley State New Music Ensemble took NC and offered their tracked out performance uh, recording of, of NC to a bunch of remixers, and then they took those remixes and adapted some of them back into live performances. I think that would be a really cool way to, yeah, to do it true. for opera. Well, I think if you, if you consider the idea of making it amenable and, and available for remix as a pre-compositional supposition when you started working on an opera project... Yeah, that's true. You'd probably write it differently. Well, you could you could think about you know the libretto could be available for remix or right. lots of different. There's so much different kinds of content that could be you know the way you format it when you generate it. You if you thought about remix possibilities at that time, I think it would be very rich uh, in possibilities. And certainly in the right kind of multimedia presentation as well. I know a lot of the things that that you guys do, Kristen, in, involve electronics and and video playback and things like that and so that would be something that i think that piece of it at least would be shareable yeah very shareable and very remixable yeah Yeah, i just saw um i was just in los angeles and i just saw the industry's opera that they did um in union station um and uh the audience all wore headphones and they moved around the space the singers were singing all over the space the musicians were in one specific part of union station and so you had um And then the singers had inner ear monitors so they could hear the musicians um, to sing. And so it, it, but you would see people were in Union Station just going to catch the train and suddenly someone was singing (laughs) opera right next to them. And there are all these people with headphones and they're like, what the hell's going on? But it was a, 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 it's a remix of a different nature because for those people passing through Union Station, they were experiencing something completely unexpected that they had no idea why this was happening. You know, and then that for, is awesome. That's delightful. I think I read about that actually. Huh? I think I read about that last week when we were getting we we're putting the show together. But that's yeah, that's delight. That's a really delightful uh, remix, of, and it's it's an example of that live remix, which is a, a tricky needle to thread. And I and it's a a remix of kind of conceptual space. Like you've got, you've got this space is or, or functional space, I guess I should say, where this yeah. space is for this thing, but it, we're also using it for this thing today. And then there's this, there are people that are experiencing both of these functions, and it's I, I don't know, that's a very cool idea. Yeah, that is very cool. Yeah. Why didn't we have that on the show last week, Dave? Because we were, I don't remember. Because I'm a boob and I'm yeah. bad at making shows. Well, jumping from things at the very forefront. The bleeding edge, if you will, of new new music and new art, um, recently refurbished, um, is a piano uh, built by Leonardo da Vinci um, that has recently been on display. I think it was in Poland, somewhere. But it's a harpsichord-like instrument that bows the strings. And I, I looked around and I couldn't find anything that actually showed the inner workings of this thing and how it functions. Um, but I read that it's like got spinning discs or something that like rub on the strings. <laughs> so uh, you can, there's actually, uh, you know, it's an audio clip on the website 
uh, or there, I've seen it posted in a lot of different ways. I'm going to post WQXR's blog uh, about it. But there's a guy does a performance on it, and it sounds like bowed strings. So, it sounds like bowed piano. I mean, you've heard bowed piano before, right? I mean, yeah. That's very cool. But, the, I mean, all the bowed piano that I've seen before is extraordinarily tedious. Yeah. Like, it involves a lot of preparation and a lot of threading of of hair and a huge mess. So th- it's very cool. And I, I was telling you about this thing, I, I don't, and I don't remember what they called it, but I, there was like a crowdfunding project or something for a kind of bowed piano type instrument that I, that I saw recently that's similar to this. Um, and there, it was, you know, obviously way too expensive for a normal person to pick up. There were, you know, 10 or 15 grand for, for one, but you know, it's a piano. So it's a cheap piano. Um, but, uh, anyway, it's a very cool thing. I love the idea of new kinds of acoustic instruments. When we think of inventing new instruments, we're always thinking of, you know, things that you press buttons on, like like this doohickey in front of me. Um, that, but there's still really interesting things you could do with acoustic sounds. So that's uh, anyway, very cool. Um, and uh, this last story, Sam, <laughs> uh, this is well, another... This is the Sam story as this well. This another Sam story. Now, I have to say that, that when I originally... I didn't encounter this as a story. The story is about... Uh, how this uh, phenomenon affected the record sales of a certain song. I experienced this video as just a normal YouTube consumer. Right. It's a video of a guy dancing to Living, Living on a Prayer uh, by Bon Jovi at a basketball game. So they're blaring Living on a Prayer at a basketball game, and the guy starts doing a very active dance and lip sync routine and getting everybody in the crowd around him into it with him, and they're all smiling and high-fiving, and it's just hilarious. So I experienced it just because it was out, and it was trending on YouTube, and I saw it, and I watched it, and I actually tweeted it and said, this guy reminds me of Augusta Reed Thomas when I first met her at the 2000 Jude in Buffalo. Because just the, the crazy, emphatic dancing, she, I, I tell the story all the time. When she came in to do our master class, I was waiting. Everybody's waiting for her to come in. And she walks in and starts, like, prancing around the room and pointing at people and making weird improvised noises and trying to get everybody to do it with her. And so that kind of ecstatic excitement reminded me. But the, the story is that – now, this uh, video was originally uploaded in 2009 – Somebody re-uploaded it recently, um, and in a very short amount of time, it got tw- it was played on YouTube 12 million times, liked on Facebook 1.7 million times, and because of that, "Living on a Prayer" by Bon Jovi is in the top tw- is in the 25 spot. At least it was when this was printed, as of November 23rd. It's on a weekly Billboard. ranking, so it's still yeah. at 25 as we're recording it. Okay, Billboard's Hot 100. So, and I, when I put this in the doc, I said, "Power of the People," you know. You can so, see if you're watching the video, I'm showing the 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 Billboard Hot 100 chart on the web, and there's a little uh, little yellow symbol next to number 25, "Living on a Prayer" with an R E in it. That means re-entry. That means it's back on the chart after not being on the chart. Uh, so that's <laughs> it's so weird. It's so weird. So, one, the way media technology is working now, one guy who decided to re-upload this video and give it a fresh, you know, start on YouTube has created, like, has changed the, the pop charts by just deciding to upload a video to YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> totally. It's amazing. And, and this is something that was made possible when Billboard changed their formula for determining the Billboard charts earlier this year in February, they they starting in in 2012 first they started including online streams as part of their calculations. They've always included things like record sales and radio airplay, but they recently started including you know after a while they started including digital sales, and then last year they started including streams from things like Pandora and Spotify, and now just this year they said well a lot of people People watch and listen to music on things like Vivo streams on Vimeo or uh, on uh, music videos on YouTube and things like that. And so they added YouTube playback to the formula. So when you watch a video on YouTube, that's something that Billboard looks for to determine 
you know what goes on the Billboard chart, and they did that after uh, Size Gangnam Style had a billion views last December, um, but it still put um, the Harlem Shake at number one earlier this year. It was a big part of moving Macklemore's Thrift Shop to number one this year. Um, it it uh, put. Ilvis is the fox. If you watched the "What the Fox Say" video uh, a few weeks ago, when that went viral, that was in the top ten, uh, Billboard top ten, and it's because of this. And and Sam and I were talking about this before the show. I think this is going to cause them to tweak the formula because this is not the sort of thing that Billboard is designed to surface. They're not trying. They're trying to surface the the, the thing that that people are buying and that people are engaging with in uh, more of a commercial way. And this kind of viral video is interesting and it's neat, but I'm not sure it's the sort of thing that that the billboard chart is really for, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to distinguish if it's a legitimate play. If it's it's an authorized music video, they're going to count it. But if it's something like this, they're not going to count it. I mean, how are they going to... I don't know. It would seem that that if this video has been up on YouTube long enough that it's been, you know blessed by the the label and the publisher right if i mean because i'm sure it's got an ad from from either the label or the publisher or both that's attached to it and it's been id matched through the youtube content id system so i'm I, wondering what uh, effect this has had on actual sales um like if anyone you know imagine all the soccer moms out there who were you know, sporting the big hair in high school when this song um, was first on the charts and they engaged this song again. They're like, oh, I'm going to get that on my iTunes account or whatever. Right. It could be. Well, in that that regard, maybe it is doing the right thing. Maybe I'm totally wrong about that. I don't know, but to put it in context, Billboard streaming um, is, Billboard says that 94% 94% of the success, in other words, why it's back to 25, 94% of it is due to streaming. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, and I think, Kristen, you're absolutely right that the what coming up with a heuristic that would divide the the viral basketball game video from the official Ilvis the Fox video would be really tricky. And why does it have to be about money rather than the, if, if it really is supposed to be about what is what are people listening to? Like, what is the actual intention of Billboard? Is it OK for it to be the actual intention is what are people listening to? Yeah. Because if that's what if that's what it's doing, then that's what it's already doing. Because that download, whether they're buying something or they're just listening to it that one time, that's what they're listening to. So it should count. Right. That's true. Yeah. I, I, I think of it as the 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 money thing because they're an industry publication. They're kind of a, a trade publication. Right. But uh, and obviously what people are listening to and what people are buying are pretty closely related most of the time. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's, it's, it's an interesting thing to follow. And it's something that I would imagine we're going to see more of uh, now that YouTube videos are such an important part of the Billboard formula. And music um, consumption generally. Um, I would like to say, and, and using the vast media empire that is Sound Notion, I want to know who that guy is. <laughs> you are you you can't just figure that out through the Google. Well, I haven't tried yet, but oh, I'm hoping. Well, so you're just being lazy. <laughs> I'm being lazy. Well, I'm first using the the vast media empire at my disposal before I actually do any work. <laughs> you know, um, I want to know who that guy is because he's got some sweet moves. <laughs> And we will leave you with those sweet moves. We'll have a link to those sweet moves in the show notes. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for being with us this morning. We're going to wrap the show, but before we go, do you have any uh, any last stuff you want to plug? I know you mentioned the Prototype Festival January 8th to 19th earlier. Do you have any anything else coming up at here or, or anything I- else? I just want to say prototypefestival.org because we didn't say it. So please come to our website uh, and check out what we're doing. And I hope you'll join us in January for all the fun stuff that's going to unfold. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Lots of great media there. You can learn all about Prototype and um, find a link to here and see all the cool programs they have going on at here as well. All kinds of great stuff. We'll have links to those in our show notes. Those will be at soundnotion.tv slash sn. Um, you can also leave us a comment there. We'd love for this conversation to continue on after the fact, our, our kind of post-show conversation, uh, if you will. 
And um, if you can do that on our site, you can do that on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. Follow us, like us, subscribe to us, do all the things with the internet machine. If you have a story or a topic that you think would make a great uh, addition to our show, you can tweet it with hashtag SN Weekly, and we're always looking at that as we're preparing the show. Um, you can subscribe to this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV in the iTunes store, including our brand new show, Patch In, all about electronic music um, with Nate Blyton and Ben Furman. Uh, great show, and they're going to they're gonna be doing that every month. Uh, if you want to support us, you can use the Amazon affiliate search on the side of our site for doing your Christmas shopping. Um, if you just search for whatever the thing is you're already going to get, it'll whisk you away to Amazon. And after that, it'll look just like any other regular Amazon trip. It won't cost you anymore. It won't look any different, but we get a little tiny commission, and that's really helpful for us as well. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you back here next week.